If you will go back and look at the commendation as to who authored the sequence hymn, one of the names that is up there is a man by the name of Harry Burley. Harry Burley was organist choir master at St. George's Church, New York City, almost a century ago. It's commendable, interesting, and challenging because Harry Burley should not have been in that position. Why? It wasn't that he wasn't a gifted musician. It was that he was black. And his, as his name was put forward, a number of the members of the vestry threatened to resign and withhold their pledge if Harry Burley was, in fact, hired. And back in that system, especially in the Northeast, what ran the church in terms of budget were the pledges of the vestry. In fact, you worked hard to get very well-to-do members to your vestry so that, in essence, their pledge would fund the budget, and then everything else that came in, well, that's nice if you needed it, but you didn't always count on it, unless you were still in a system where churches sold pews to families. That was the other source of revenue. And so it was a serious issue that vestry people would leave and withhold their pledges because St. George's was, and still is, a vast building. It's this big Victorian barn of a place. And sort of the center of low church evangelicalism in the city of New York at the time. They even had, at that point, a pulpit it was dead center, and you walked a winding staircase up to the pulpit, and so you were preaching way up here to this huge crowd of people, including a three-sided balcony. Uh, thankfully, when I became the rector, that pulpit was gone. But I heard the stories about Harry, and eventually what happened was is that it was J.P. Morgan who stepped in and said, let him go. This is the right thing to do. I'll cover any pledges that, that we lose. And in fact, did. And as a result, marked in the city of New York, in the midst of a very high fashion congregation at the time, a step in the direction that actually allowed Harry Burley to be a part of hymns just like this because his congregation was trying to find a way to live that out in the midst of the extraordinarily socially, educationally, and socioeconomically stratified nature of New York high society. You see, at that point, it was still within a generation that slavery was practiced and commended on the part of many churches in the city of New York. And so this was a huge and extraordinary move. It was hard for him, even though he made a name for himself and, in fact, became the source of some of the spiritual tunes that was used in Dvorak's symphony from the New World, because Dvorak was living literally right around the corner. He always felt alone. As a friend of mine said, an American who served in a church in Toronto for a while, he said, it's, he put it this way, it's not that people aren't nice to you but you're really never a part of the furniture. And that's exactly how Harry felt there. And yet God used him in a remarkable way. He gave, God the, he gave Harry the grace and the courage to minister feeling very much alone in a hard place. The hard place didn't mean that Harry was in the wrong place. And in fact, it was the hard place that told Harry that he was in the right place. I, as your bishop, in this 2017 conference of clergy, really am asking and exhorting you to minister in a hard place. I know it. I feel it. This is not an easy place in which to proclaim the gospel either inside the church, much less in our culture. Inside the church, because we, so many of us, are in fact quite lost when it comes to defining even the nature of what the gospel is. We don't have a sense of what authority looks like. I read an article just not long ago from Commonweal Magazine, 
And it was written by a Lutheran scholar who brought us back to this very important meeting that took place in 1967 between Joseph Ratzinger, then Cardinal, and Karl Barth. No notes were taken about that meeting. It was off the record entirely. The only thing that we have were the questions that both came up that Bart wanted to ask Ratzinger and that Ratzinger wanted to ask Bart. We have those questions. Everything else becomes fill in the blank. But they say something important, and it points to a dilemma that we actually have yet to figure out. So I just want to give you some of the questions. From a theological standpoint, was it really true the Protestants wondered that the gospel depends on the church if it's going to be preserved and actualized? Weren't matters really the other way around? This is the Protestant speaking to Ratzinger. Was it really the church that depended on the gospel if the church is to be truly apostolic? In other words, didn't ecclesial life and witness always need to be tested against the living word of scripture? And didn't that word remain sovereign as a critical norm over and against the church and its traditions? The priority of the word over ecclesiastical tradition was the Protestant concern, and that's what they brought to the table. By contrast, the opposite, of course, was raised. Counter questions such as, without any authoritarian magisterium, who speaks for the Reformed churches? If hierarchy is, in fact, the problem, what are we to say about Protestant anarchy? Are we not faced with a cacophony of Protestant voices, each with its own claim to be authoritative? Doesn't the Holy Spirit operate in and through an ecclesiastical structure, or is the Spirit's work always freewheeling and outside, as it were, the system? Again, doesn't the living word operate in and through church tradition, or is it always beyond and over against them? Laxity could hardly be the antidote to rigidity. Or as someone quipped, the Roman Catholic Church has unity, but they certainly don't have freedom. And the Protestant Church has freedom, but no unity. That was, those were the questions then. They, they have not gone away. And we feel it particularly within our tradition because we actually try to hold ends of the stick and find a way to bring it, work out some sort of mutual center point between tradition and ecclesial authority and the, the supremacy of the word. So even in our ordination services, you actually make two commitments. The commitment, do you believe the Bible to be the word of God and to contain all things necessary for salvation? And that's the one you sign because we deeply lean on the Protestant side of that continuum. And yet, who's presiding at that service? Well, somebody who represents the whole church within an apostolic order to which all clergy are accountable. It, we try to do, you see, a both hand. And then something else that was certainly anticipated by that point, but not in the level of which we now have it, and that has to do with not the primacy of either authorities, but rather a new primacy, and that's this authority. The primacy of my experience to define what truth is and what truth isn't over and against, in fact, both external authorities. How do I know it's right? You know, I just feel it is. Without any capacity, either within the collegium of the body of Christ or those who went, preceded us, or within the, the written word, and we actually feel quite free to jettison all of that if it's in my heart to do it. And we're acting it out. And because that's the case, to stand in any form, particularly dressed like this, or however ever it is you dress when you preside, 
to claim by virtue of your position integrity in this kind of magisterial authority, even in its Anglican Episcopal expression, and speak with some authority about the authority of nature of scripture to define the boundaries, the parameters, and the content of who we are and what it is that we're called to believe. In some circles, we're just talking Swahili, and they have no idea. Absolutely no idea. It's not just, you see, that the language of the gospel itself is foreign. It's the way it is communicated that is foreign. No wonder that actually some of the liveliest and most well-attended churches, despite what you and I might quibble with, are churches that do neither who appeal to experience and use scripture as a way to validate experience, and that that becomes the starting point, rather than, in some kind of historic sense, God has said, God has done, therefore, we step in and believe. That's actually the assumption in the Corinthian lesson. Paul is calling his people, in the midst of an extraordinary amount of division, to faith, and what he does is that he reminds them of what it was that he taught them, and in fact, they have learned, and he says in very kind of magisterial language, first I handed on to you as a first importance what I had in turn to receive. See, laying out a historic precedent that he anticipated would be carried forth not just with him, but that there would be a legacy that each generation would have the responsibility to take up and to communicate effectively as men and women who had received something, not making it up, but actually passing on something that Paul describes as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died, then he appeared to James, the reading, the reason the reading's in there is sort of, here's James here, here's the one we're giving thanks for, and then to all the apostles, and then lastly of all, to me. In other words, the assumption that the scripture has is that we're actually responsible for and passing on an historically grounded treasure. That God has revealed nothing less than himself in and through the historic arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, Jesus says to Philip in a way that literally becomes for us a kind of plumb line to help us determine in the midst of the many people who say they speak for God, well, does it look like Jesus or not? Does it line up with his words? And not just merely his words, but his nature, his, his way of operating. To, to borrow the phrases out of his lecture, the lectures that have been given, that there is an affective nature to what it means to be a witness for Jesus, as well as an objective, authoritative nature of what it means. And it's actually the two together, both, as it were, the changed life, as well as the nature of Scripture itself, that speaks a better word than able, to quote Hebrews, in a way that, in fact, invites people, calls them to a supernatural faith in Jesus Christ. But this is crazy difficult. I mean, get out there with people who don't believe any of this and begin to have these conversations whose basic assumptions about life are entirely different from the things that we assume to be true. Struggle at finding language to communicate the timelessness of the gospel in a way that does not compromise the character and the magisterial nature of the message and yet still communicate it in a way that actually has the invitational appeal to come and serve this one whom we call the king of all kings and the lord of all lords. It takes the Holy Spirit <laughs> for that to happen. 
You see, because in the end, it's not so much a matter of technique. It's actually the fruit of deep prayer, a humility that God works in us that would, because where we would naturally want to sort of stand up and be arrogant in the midst of the opposition, to, there's a kind of softness, a moving with compassion, the capacity to turn the other cheek in the midst of genuine difficulty, the free capacity to be able to forgive even when one is wrong, that is a part at the very heart of what it means to be a witness for Jesus. It's just not a matter of getting right doctrine. Right doctrine can be used as a weapon. And I've seen plenty of people who claim orthodoxy who will do just that. <laughs> and the, the fruit that it bears is a congregation that wants to take up the cudgel, you know, at every turn against all of those perpetrators, and then you fill in the blank of what that might be. So what does it take to live in the midst of this kind of environment and to serve the gospel faithfully, to serve Jesus faithfully, and to live as a leader in a community like ours that is in the midst of these kinds of extraordinary questions that aren't going to go away anytime soon. And this is where I want to go back to James. James, brother of our Lord, called James the just. Hundreds and hundreds of people came to Christ through the ministry of James. But here's why, and this is where he gets the name Just. He was called Just because he was a man of profound integrity and of deep humility and compassion, and that those were held up as high values in the places where they served. I rarely go to a congregation where humility is held up as a gospel value in the way that we see in the life of James the Just. And in fact, I've actually been only to one congregation in my whole life. Uh, and it wasn't too long ago where, as, they as the church had handed out, it was a brand new church plant, and so they had a list of core values, and one of them, like number two, was humility. The willingness to serve, the willingness to wash feet, the capacity to be wrong, the willingness to forgive quickly, and to understand that it is only by the mercy of God that we have such a gift. And that humility literally breathed throughout the service. And what it did to me as a visitor, it made the rector, in the way he presented himself and the way his clergy operated, just imminently trustable. I thought... You really mean this stuff, don't you? This isn't a show. You're here to wash feet. And that washing feet paradigm was the way they presided the Eucharist, the way the word was preached. There was no need to impress or to somehow get people to like you. There was a deep, profound inner security that just flowed through the leadership that was just unbelievably appealing. Now, I, I, know, I know what the temptations are. E even today, as I'm sort of putting the tail end on the sermon, because a part of what I try to do when it comes to this is try to say something that has some coherence with what has already been presented. And many of you all are just phenomenal preachers. So uh, there is an extraordinary temptation to want to really look good quote the right authors, be impressive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I have to face the fact that that is actually quite the opposite of anything resembling humility. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. So very, very different from the kind of smugness that inf infects both our culture and often our church, the desire to be right and to get other people to think the way you do always is accompanied by the cudgel of smugness. Always. Absolutely always. So that even in the conversations that we have had around extraordinarily controversial issues, like gay marriage, for example, 
even though I hold a position that's extraordinarily clear, I've tried to say at every point, but you know, I, I could be wrong. And that, that, that's, in my opinion, not actually a sign of weakness. Just the opposite. It's the sign of being open to what it is that the Lord wants to do in our midst, knowing that in the midst of that particular division, as well as others, there's almost no middle ground. And yet, we are charged to live out our life together in a way that allows us to be able to say with some real integrity, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us, not just to the ones who win the vote or the one who's in charge. But see, again, going back to James, who became a very key part in the wrestling between the conversion of the Gentiles and all that that might have meant in the book of Acts, finding a way, is there a way that we can spread our arms wide enough to both affirm the things that are creedally central and still find a way to wrestle through the others that aren't specifically included in the creed and that that not be a sign of weakness? but in fact actually a sign of humility because we're trying to find a way to discern something together. That's my passion for that. So I looked to James, confident as he was. <laughs> Jesus appeared to him personally. It's almost like, can't leave out my brother in the midst of the many places where he appeared after the resurrection. And yet God worked something powerful in him. He was known as a man of prayer, among other things, a deep intercessor. In fact, the hagiography was is that he spent so much time on his knees that the calluses on his knees were just rock hard. He knew in a way that my hope is that we would continue to know that in the end, this kind of life and these kinds of congregations are actually, in the end, the fruit of intercession. It's not about technique, doing a better job to welcome newcomers, having more dinners. All of those are great. But in the end, if hearts are to be changed, if divisions are to be melted, if the gospel is going to be preached with power in the way that people, so that people are in fact converted, if the sick are to be healed, if there's going to be a sense of God speaking as we gather together in his name, all of those are the fruit of prayer. Otherwise, it's just manipulation. Without intercession, the best of what we offer our people in the end is showmanship and manipulation. The scriptures, as well as the liturgy, presumes, assumes that even as we are gathering, we've prayed so that we can pray well together, so that we can hear well together. And be open that, in fact, that the Lord can use anybody he wants to be able to speak the things that he has to say. And keeping our ear to the ground about trying to discern together what it is that God is doing. Is any of this easy? Of course not. In the world, you will have tribulation. That's a promise just as strong as my peace I give you, my peace I leave to you. To make the decision to stand in nothing more than the prayers of the saints, to have only in front of you the scholarship that God has given you in his word and in the life and the traditions of the church, to speak a language that is very, very difficult for the culture to hear, including our parishioners who were always wary about whose side are you really on and are you listening to fake news or not. It's, it, it takes a miracle from God for him to break in and do something in our midst. But you see, that's precisely what are asking, he, we are asking him for. And if the price of the miracle is being Hebrews 12 chastened in a way that feels like personal breakage, he is not above doing that because he is more interested in exalting his son than you feeling particularly complete and happy. It's a hard place. But it is also 
It is the place of glory. Because to step into the midst of that place with only the armor of God, to speak the name of Jesus and actually believing that lives will be changed, to give bread and wine in a way that actually becomes life for people, is in fact the only thing that we've got. Everything else is wood, hay, and stubble. But I'd rather be here than anywhere. I'd rather be engaged in the hard part of ministry, to be called upon to pay the price and to live it out in a way that is never easy, but often fruitful. In the seminar we just had where Chris was talking about healing, he was talking about the fact that some get healed and some don't. No, no surprise to any of us. But I remember a quote that Francis McNutt said, and he said, but what if we didn't pray at all? Isn't it better that some be healed than not to pray? And that's how I feel about this. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. And sometimes that's your parish. Sometimes that's your community. But yet, do it anyway. Give, even though you don't get a lot back. Do it anyway. Make the sacrifice to pray and to fast, even if you don't see the fruit. Do it anyway. Make the time to keep yourself within the grace of God as far as it might be possible. Begging God, even as we did coming in, Lord, have mercy. That's, that's anything but um, an antiseptic prayer. Knowing that that's where the life is knowing that that's where the fruit is, knowing that it is in the crucible of the hard place that the crucified Lord is glorified. Amen.